you can learn a lot about what a society considers quality of life by looking at how services speak. Let's take the UK as an example and look at this public transport sign. You'll notice that the word please is used a lot in the UK. Now, England doesn't have a constitution. They're basically ba based on a gentleman's agreement from the Middle Ages called the Magna Carta to secure citizens' safety and security, which means you need to be civil and you need to negotiate and you need to say please to have a good result. Other, perhaps more sophisticated societies, like Japan, require people to know how to behave in a particular situation. So maybe you need to explain it to some more detail to be able to guarantee that people are safe and secure. Then again, sometimes it can go a bit wrong, <laughs> and maybe the subway isn't the place really to do sexual education. But things happen. Then we have America, a constitutional democracy. Here, you don't really need to say please, you don't really need to explain much, except exactly what to do, and do it, because it's the law. Because the law is what guarantees your safety and security. But now, we are in the Nordic countries. We are in social democracy. We actually trust government and politicians so we don't need any explanation. We have all decided together that we'll put the garbage in the bin. We have all decided together we will not smoke on the bus. Uh, we will let the elderly sit, and we will eat fish. <laughs> the interesting thing here is what the text is about. Have a nice journey. That is the ultimate goal. We've all decided together that we need to do these things to have a nice life. No feet on the seat. Have a nice journey. <laughs> this is social democracy. Which kind of brings me in here. Uh, on a more serious note, the Nordic model is a term from um, e economy. It describes a certain way of setting up uh, the economy and society that balances the power of the state, with the balance of citizens and the power of business. It's being researched quite heavily at the moment because in conventional economic theory, the success of the Nordic countries cannot be explained. If you come from the Chicago School of uh, Economy, uh, you cannot have a society where you have to pay high taxes, where a third of the citizens actually work in the public sector, and for them to be sustainable. But it turns out that that's the way things are done around here, and uh, the Nordic economies have come really well through the financial crisis. Uh, they're on top of the ratings in terms of innovative societies, uh, top of the ratings in terms of quality of life, uh, but also in productivity. So it's a bit of a mystery how this can happen. But I think it's really interesting, and this is where service design comes into the picture, there is so much emphasis put on this balance, and actually that citizens or humans shall have the power uh, that will be well balanced with these other actors. And this is where service design comes in, because we have some extremely powerful tools to balance that power between humans, between the state, and with business. So let me show you a couple of examples from the Nordic countries. This is some work we did with uh, the Norwegian Directorate of Immigration four years ago. They have shown a real long-term commitment to putting users at the heart of how they do things, and the results are now becoming incredibly clear. If you are a refugee, or if you're an expert coming to Norway and you want to live there, you have to work through these things. It's an incredibly complicated process. It may take years, and it's governed by not only technical issues, but by policy. We spent, as you always do, quite a lot of time understanding how this process is experienced from these users that want to become citizens. And here's an example. Elbi from Sudan, 
The process took about 10 years before he became a citizen and his family also could live in Norway in a legal way. But of course, what they all said, the worst experience is the waiting. You don't know what happens and you spend so much time worrying. So it's got an enormous human cost, the waiting. But it's also got huge system costs because you get confused and worried people spending your resources in the wrong way. One thing we delivered for them was 10 principles for coherent services. Um, and quite often, I'm a bit skeptical about design principles as, as something very meaningful because it's just words. But it turns out it became a very powerful tool because you can manage by it. Uh, the leaders took this seriously. It is now part of any mandate for a project with the Directorate for Immigration, you have to sign up to these principles to be able to do anything, whether you are internal or external. So with huge commitment from the organizations, they have been extremely successful. And it took about a year and a half after that was delivered until we saw the first real true success. The first principle was that users uh, need to be treated in the same way by all the different agencies that meet them not only the directorate. So if you apply for citizenship, you're likely to be in touch with an embassy. Uh, there are different departments, um, uh, justice and public, social inclusion, everyone. And what happened was that these principles were adopted by everyone. So suddenly, um, the, it spread, and all these different actors that meet uh, new citizens now operate on the same principles. And we had a real success a couple of weeks ago when they launched a new website. This is four years into the work. Um, uh, and we didn't do this, so we just saw it and thought, that's amazing. This is one of the channels where the principles are applied. Uh, so you see on top there, I have applied. You are waiting for an answer to happen. Here's how we will help you out. So I just wanted to show that as an example of where government really puts the citizen at the heart of the way they do things, and how, with long-term commitment, it can bring real success. But let's talk about the other side. Here's our favorite insurance company in the world. It's the largest general insurer in Norway. And we have worked with them now for six years uh, on a whole range of projects. They have a deep commitment to customer centricity um, in their organization. But the amazing thing uh, was that they needed it. So when we started working with them, they were on the 50th, 56th place of Norwegian uh, national customer satisfaction scores. Now, last year, they were number 11. For a company which is in, in an industry that people generally don't like, that's amazing. There's an insurance company actually competing with Vinmonopole, our local Systembolaget, and Toyota. Uh, it's unheard of. But of course, what they did, they knew how to use service design in a targeted way, all across the journey from uh, customers that were new to the end, all across the channels. And in some way, they knew how to use service design to help customers enter the organization. And it wasn't just us. We were part of a big change program. Where we helped them was really to get a surgical approach to improvement. Where do you go in and do the things that matter the most to customers? And I'll show you one example. This is a um, procedure for people that work at the call center uh, receiving claims. So you have had an accident and you call your insurance company. These are highly skilled people. They uh, are extremely focused on how can I solve your case as quickly and efficiently as possible. So the first thing they often asked was, uh, so what is your customer number? But when we talked to the most experienced people in the call center, they said, you know, we usually spend the first two many minutes letting customers just empty themselves because something horrible happened to them. And they think, since we are an insurance company, we're here to screw them. If we let them talk, then everything else goes much quicker. We actually have shorter calls, uh, and the results are much better. So we realized in the drive for efficiency, they had forgotten about the most important thing, the human thing. So here's the routine. 
the first thing you ask is, how are you doing? After what happened to you? Is your family all right? Oh, good. Now, let's, let me figure out how I can help you. So it's hundreds of these things done with precision creates amazing results. Uh, but there's something about this long-term commitment that I think we've seen here in the Nordics and why service design now starts to create evidence that it can have enormous impact. Um, it took about five years to really see the results. Um, this is their financial performance. Their, their share price doubled in two years. And of course, it's not down to what people like us do. Uh, but I asked the CEO, how do you measure uh, the impact of your customer experience work? And he said, you know, in the end, I don't really care. It's part of running a well-managed company. Uh, but we also got more interesting results uh, because they also set in place some very accurate measurement systems. And we now have very precise numbers on things we all know. Customer satisfaction correlates with loyalty. Customer satisfaction uh, correlates with sales. But perhaps the most surprising thing was the degree to which customers would spend more money with them when they were satisfied. It went straight off the scales, and you really wouldn't believe it. But they have the numbers, um, and I'll share some of that with you. So those were a couple of examples of how we've seen that service design has had kind of a, a found a platform in the Nordics uh, to really uh, to really grow and prove that it's got value. And then I thought, you know, that balancing act is really where service design is at the moment. Service design has become a really serious business. We used to be incredibly concerned with just designing a good customer experience. But we've now learned also that we need to design for the organization and design so that what's wonderful for the customer can actually be done by the organization. And we've also learned that you need to design the things that will make a business impact, not just things that are great for customers. If it doesn't have a real business impact, it won't really fly. So I'd like to speak a little bit more about these things. I just take it for granted that everyone here is incredibly concerned with understanding customers and designing for it. So let's move on beyond that. Let's look at how we connect the business to customers, the business rationale, the things that make leaders take important decisions. Service design has been very kind of lodged in this idea about the customer journey. But the customer journey really only describes the engagement between the organization and the customer. The thing is, it's incredibly difficult to make a good business case based on the customer journey. You can say, we'll make a small improvement here and a small improvement there. But is it going to raise your entire customer satisfaction score? Is it going to help you acquire new customers? Is it going to help you retain the ones you have? You can't really find it find out. So you need to go one level up and look at the customer life cycle and really understand how customers look at your sector. So here's an example. Uh, we worked through about 15 European telcos and tried to figure out what's similar. And, and this is the way things look and it's, it's amazing how similar it is. No one really cares about telcos. It's like water. Although, sorry telcos, you care a lot. Um, but there's loads of investment going into selling uh, to new customers. And you have a great experience because you actually get a cool gadget as well. But then you come home, and you try to set up your email, and you try to get your calendar to work, and you end up in enormous frustration. So you got it to work, and you're back again in your perfect telco experience, which is a non-experience until you need to change your tariff, get a new phone, or solve a problem, and you end up in that big black hole of Sambo music. The thing is, most telcos look like this. This is how people experience telcos. But here, you can start making business decisions. How are we going to be different? Are we going to be the telco that takes away that curve at the end there uh, and retain customers longer? Are we going to be the telco that onboards customers better? And here's another example. This is from insurance. 
It's also really about looking at where the pain points are. Where are the hotspots? Uh, so, for instance, I have a problem. I need help. What, what do you do? Do you go in and create better routines for helping people? No, you need to look at, at the source of the issue. And, of course, the source might be completely different. In this case, we found that when you have a new customer, if you invest in them, the first three months will have an amazing impact. It will reduce irritations and pressure uh, on the organization massively, but also it's actually where loyalty is built. Another case, uh, uh, we worked with uh, Orange and Barclay card in the UK with the first mobile NFC payment solution. And we know from similar types of services that maybe more than 20% of customers who actually buy a new product, if they can't get it to work the first time, they will never try again. That's a massive business problem. You've sold and you've acquired customers. They're in your books and they're not using your service. So we knew that uh, all effort needed to go in to design the perfect start. Now, you can also start putting data into this. Uh, so the data on the bottom here, the hotspots map, is from some work we did around rail travel in the UK, where we used different data sources. Uh, public customer satisfaction uh, scores, internal scores, over a few years' time. And uh, it enabled us to see where's the biggest potential. Now, What's the one thing you want to do if you want to raise the customer experience for everyone? Reach the highest volume of customers. Do th something important for them when they're really irritated or when they really need it. What do you think is the most important thing? Is it Wi-Fi on every station? Is it more people on the platform? Any guesses? Delays? Well, what we found, and very surprisingly, was that there's one thing Everyone needs a clean toilet at every station. Everyone will see it. You will use it when you really need it, and it will make your life better. Not a wow moment, but something that will bring you loyal customers. Now, let's take a look at how to connect customers to the organization. Again, this is where kind of the first generation of service design came from the customer journeys and how you interact through the different channels. This was the problem that sparked service design. But it's, it's moved on. And now it's really about understanding how the different departments in the organization work together to meet customer needs. And then there are all these things that go across. What are the policies that may prevent something from actually happening? And these are the things that you can't really see if you just look at customers and channels. And I'm not arguing that service designers should go in and do these things which are deeply in the domain of business process engineering, but we need to understand them. Because if we don't understand them, we will design the wrong solutions. Here's an example, again from a mobile company. Your service designers will understand this. On the top, it's a simple idea. You get a new mobile phone, you buy it online, you come into the shop and they help you set it up so that you've got your email and your calendar and you can go home safely. Great idea, no-brainer from a customer point of view, let's just go and do that. Well, let, let's look at the impact on the organization. Actually, you need to change the whole way the sales teams work. And we're talking about hundreds of shops. These are people who have been trained in selling, suddenly they need to be trained in servicing, in IT. That's got quite a high cost, both in terms of money and in terms of policy. Because if you go into the policy level, you will see that you might actually have to change your hiring routines, and you might even have to fire some people who will never be able to deliver that kind of a service. So this is a way to understand what is the real cost of creating that particular customer experience. So it might be simple, seen from the outside, but we need to understand the real cost. It doesn't mean they shouldn't do it or not, but you know and you can take a qualified decision so that this service will actually come out and uh, create value in real life. The other thing, of course, which is important, is to engage the organization. And we've, we're seeing a lot of that around here, but the important thing is scale. Nothing will happen if you just do it with the teams you're working with. So here's some work we did with London Underground uh, not too long ago, and they're going to create a new station model. 
So London Underground stations, uh, they basically designed 100 years ago. But they know it has to change. So in simple terms, as uh, we go digital, we don't buy tickets anymore, what do you do with all those people that sit behind the glass? They knew they needed to change the whole station experience. Uh, but the, the issues here weren't really about the customer, they were internal. Uh, the unions of London Underground are some of the most powerful unions in the world, and when they strike, it's trouble. So the chief exec said, I will engage all your employees in this change. And he promised the mayor of London that there would be no strikes. So what we did was to set up a system by which we engaged all of the station staff in designing the new stations. Uh, we trained the trainers, so we were able to uh, train about 2,775 people and engage them in how this new station experience should be and what it should be like. Uh, and, and the results were, were simply amazing. Uh, we actually had one participant that uh, came by our office not too long ago when he saw our sign on the door and he came in and he said, I just want to thank you because that was a great experience. So this change is happening. If you look at the news or if you look at the stations, you won't see massive change yet because the change is happening behind the scene and it's enabling what, uh, what's going to happen. So in this case, designing for the organization uh, meant designing for the change to happen. So to conclude, uh, I think in this balancing act we talked about, whether it's between uh, citizens, state and business, this is really where we've seen that service design has grown up. It is now a seriously powerful tool for business managers to get things done, as long as we design for the humans, and we design for the organizations, and we design for the business at the same time. But of course, if you don't want to be that serious, you can always do something like that. Mm-hmm.